welcome to my channel. I post a video every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Selenese's stock and analyzing its financial ratios. Become a member and support the channel for 99 cents a month. You can also get a more in-depth valuation for $9.99 or $49.99 a month. The highest level is $99 a month for a private Zoom session to discuss financial statements and you could ask any questions. See the link in the top of the description. Selenice is a Fortune 500 global technology and specialty materials company headquartered in Irving, Texas. The company is the world's leading producer of acetic acid with the company's total output which currently stands at 1.95 million tons per year. Selenice is also the world's largest producer of vinyl, acetate, monomer. Selenice operates 25 production plants and 6 research centers in 11 countries, mainly in North America, Europe, and Asia. The company owns and operates the world's three largest acetic acid plants, two in Texas and one in China. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 12.7 billion market cap. So that's the value of the company according to the stock market. And they're trading at 107 a share and they have 118 million shares outstanding. To calculate shares outstanding, it's market cap divided by stock price gives you shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. Free cash flow, that's how you value a company. You estimate the future free cash flows and discount that number back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is also how you estimate a project or an asset you want to purchase. You look at the cost and then you estimate the future free cash flows that project or asset generates. Then you discount it back to today and this way you can figure out whether it's profitable or not. Free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So if a company has positive free cash flow, they can pay down debt, pay dividends, acquire other businesses, or invest back into their business to grow it. If a company has negative free cash flow, it might not be able to do any of those things. And if a company has positive free cash flow, that means it's generating more cash than it's spending. So you usually want to invest in a company with positive, healthy free cash flow. If it's not positive, you want to look into why. You want to make sure they're using the money efficiently to grow the business and not wasting it on things that might not help the business. This company has positive and strong free cash flow each year. It goes from 600 million to 1 billion. So they have a lot of cash left over to work with. Net income is a profit and loss for the company. It's on the income statement. It's on the very bottom. It's total revenue minus total expenses. And this company also has positive and fairly consistent net income. And that's important because if you have negative net income, that means your expenses are really high and you're not operating profitably. Their revenue looks pretty good. It grows a lot from 2016 to 2018, then drops in 2019. Their profit margins are pretty consistent as well. Net profit margin is net income over revenue. It's how well you convert revenue into profit. The higher your expenses, the lower your net income, the lower your net profit margin. This company converts about 15% of its revenue into profit. That means 85% is going towards expenses. It's also good to look into the details. So why is free cash flow lower in 2016 than net income, but higher in 2019 relative to net income? We could look at the cash flow statement to figure that out. In 2019, they had net income of 858 million and free cash flow of a little over 1 billion. The way to calculate free cash flow, it starts with net income. So I would expect free cash flow to be greater than net income because in order to get free cash flow, we have to add back the non-cash items that were on the income statement. Depreciation and amortization is usually a big non-cash item. In this case, in 2019, it's 356 million dollars. So they had to add back $356 million because they reported that as an expense on the income statement. The reason the cash flow statement adds that back because that was a non-cash item. There's lots of other items that affect free cash flow. If you open up this link, operating gains losses, you can see gain and loss on sale of business, $3 million, 
Earnings losses from equity investments, negative 14 million. Pension employee benefits, 87 million. So there's lots of things to look at. I just look at the really big items, especially when I'm doing a video. But if I was doing my analysis, I might dig a little deeper. So you can see 2016 has lower free cash flow than net income. Let me show you an example of why this would occur. When a company uses accounts receivable, that's a negative to free cash flow. That detracts cash. Because when you use accounts receivable, you're selling a product or service, but you're not actually receiving any cash for it at the current time. In the future, you will be. So you could see in 2016, they took a cash hit of $59 million from changes in accounts receivables. Also in 2017, they took a hit of $110 million because they sold $110 million on credit that they didn't receive cash for. Same thing in 2018. But you can see in 2019 they received the cash, probably from these prior years. But in 2019, accounts receivable helped this company's cash flows. Accounts payable is the exact opposite. When you buy on credit, you're actually receiving a product or service that you're not paying for. So it helps free cash flow. In 2016, the company had a positive $7 million of cash flow from accounts payable. So they used accounts payable that year. 2017 they used 126 million of accounts payable, 2018 they used 15 million but they had to pay it back and it looks like they paid it back in 2019. So they had a negative 59 million dollars in accounts payable in 2019. Accounts payable is like a loan. You're receiving something but not paying for it. Same thing from the bank. You're receiving cash from the bank but you're not paying anything for it. You will in the future in a form of interest or principal payments but initially you just get the cash. Same thing with accounts payable. You're receiving a product or service that you're not paying for, but you will pay for it in the future. So there's lots of other things you can see on a cash flow statement that affect free cash flow that you should really understand. And I want to do a full video on the cash flow statement looking at every single item. This company has $3.9 billion of debt. They have $2.5 billion of equity. So they have more debt in their capital structure than equity. I prefer to invest in companies with more equity. The interest they pay in their debt is 2.94%. The cost of debt is 2.58%. To calculate cost of debt, it's interest rate times one minus the effective tax rate. And the weight of debt is 61%. That means they have 39% equity. Cost of equity is 12.84%. And we use the capital asset pricing model to figure that out. Part of the CAPM formula is the beta. The beta is how volatile the stock is relative to the market. The higher the beta, the higher the CAPM, the higher the cost of equity. The lower the beta, the lower the CAPM, the lower the cost of equity. This company has a pretty good beta, 1.37. So the stock market as a whole has a beta of 1. A beta of 1.37 means the stock moves a little more than the market. So if the market goes up, this stock will go up a little more than the market. If the market goes down, this stock should go down a little more than the market. So it's not too volatile. The WAC, the weighted average cost of capital, is 6.59%, which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. And that's the discount rate this company uses to figure out if it should take on new projects or not. What it does is it looks at the cost of the project, say it's a million dollars, and then it estimates the future cash flows that project generates. If it generates 100,000 a year for 20 years, then it discounts those 20 years of cash flows back to today. And if the future discounted cash flows is greater than a million dollars, the company will probably take on the project. If it's less than a million dollars, the company would not take on a project. You generally want to take on projects that add value to the company. So the WAC is the discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows for the model. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimate a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for that 13 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $13.8 billion. We divide that by 118 million shares. We get a calculated stock price of 117. They're trading at 107, so they're trading at an 8% discount. It's a buy according to the model, but it's pretty close to where they're trading at. Simply Wall Street has them valued at $95. So Simply Wall Street uses the average analyst estimate to come up with their valuation. 
So they're also pretty close to where they're trading at, although they're in the other direction. They're saying the stock is 13.5% overvalued. I'm saying it's undervalued. Let's see where the stock has been trading at the past few years. The stock was growing for about four years. It hit about 130 or so. Then coronavirus came and it dropped a lot. It has come up quite a bit since coronavirus, but it's still well below its all-time highs. It looks like it could be a really good value, but these are the type of companies you want to invest in. Strong, solid companies, large market caps, they have positive free cash flow, and they're going to be around for a long time. This company has been around for over 100 years. So you want to buy stocks and hold them. You can't really time the market. I don't know anybody who's made money time in the market. You could do it once or twice, but over the long term, I don't think it's possible. And you got to remember, stock price is not based on how well a company is doing. So if a company is doing poorly and not making money, the stock price can still go up if more people buy it because the stock price is based off the supply and demand of the market. The stock market is forward looking. So if investors feel a company is going to grow and be much stronger in the future, they'll buy the stock even if the company is not doing well. On the other hand, you might have companies doing really well financially, but no one's buying a stock and the people who own the stock are selling it. So the price keeps going down because the future of the company looks bleak. That's all investors' perceptions, but you as the investor need to figure the stuff out to find the real values or not. And that's hopefully what I'm going to do to help you. Let's look at the financial ratios. Really good PE, the median for the entire market 16.5, the average for the market 18.6. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. I like to see below 15 when I invest in the company. They're 14.8, so investors are paying $14.80 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is also really good. The median is 2.0, the average is 4.7. Price to sales is stock price over sales per share. To calculate sales per share, that's revenue over shares outstanding. I like to see below 2.5, there are 2.0, so investors are paying $2 for $1 revenue. Not such a great price to book. The median is 2.3, the average is 4.9. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. I like to see below 3.5, there are 5.1. So investors are paying $5.10 for $1 book value. Equity is total assets minus total liabilities on the balance sheet. Good interest coverage ratio, the median is 4.0, the average is 13.2. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They're at 9.0, I like to see above two. EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes. It's on the income statement, it's called operating income. ROE is really good. The median is 12%. The market average is 15%. ROE is net income over equity. I like to see above 20%. They're at 34%. So they provide a great value to the equity holders. Good current ratio. The median is 1.3. The average is 1.8. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. I like to see between 1.2 and 2. They're at 1.6. So they can cover their current debts and payables. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Methanex, which is the same industry as Selenice. Selenice is better in PE, but Methanex is better in price to sales, price to book, but they're both doing well in current ratio. ROE, Selenice is much better, not even close. They both have a similar amount of debt. Selenice is a really big company. They're part of the S&P 500. And the dividend yield is much higher for Selenice at 2.32%. Methanex is only 0.66%. So to summarize, I have them trading at an 8% discount. Their ratios look pretty good and their financials look really good. And this is a solid company that's been around a long time with great cash flows, great net income, and also really good products. Thanks for watching.